Mr. Kale. Brian, fancy <laughs> meeting you here. I know, I know. Uh, in fact, we, we should uh, we should open an intersections bar and we can meet every day at happy hour where we can enjoy some fresh champagne and and all of our favorite hors d'oeuvres. Well, and since we're in an asynchronous world, we could actually uh, sh happy hour is every hour, right? <laughs> it brings new uh, new meaning to it. it must be five o'clock somewhere because indeed it is. Yeah, uh, indeed. <laughs> Indeed, it is. If, well, John, if we need an excuse. You know, we we have one ready made. <laughs> I think those who who followed my work over the years know that I've never really needed an excuse. Uh, but <laughs> uh, <laughs> with that said, it's wonderful to see you. Hello, everybody. It is uh, fantastic to be here. Uh, we do have some special announcements. We're going to jump right in though because we did start a little bit late, and we have our first guest backstage. So I'm just going to officially do the welcome. Uh, hello, <laughs> welcome <laughs> to Intersections Live, a weekly conversational jam session that dives deep into the intersections among technology, innovation, culture, and ideas. Every week, every Thursday, we bring together diverse personalities and worldviews uh, in the service of greater understanding and unlearning. This is a uh, this is a time without a playbook, and we can creatively write a new one together to bring to life the future that we've either always wanted or future that we couldn't see before, and now uh, we can't unsee the possibility. I, I would love to welcome you. You're part of the show as well, so please comment uh, where you are tuning in from. Please share your comments and observations. We'll do our best to share those on screen live and also address them live. Also, if you are watching this uh, after the live show, we still get to those comments and we still review everything. So this is an ongoing virtuous community. Uh, with that, I'd love to introduce you to my co-host and uh, co-founder of Intersections, John Kao. The Economist has called him Mr. Creativity. He's a thought leader, entrepreneur, and advisor who has played a prominent role in the fields of innovation and business creativity for over 30 years. And it's one of those things where like I have been, uh, I, I, I always described myself uh, as the Madonna of, of my work, because every few years I had to find a way to reinvent myself to uh, stay relevant in this crazy world. But John has been uh, at the forefront of innovation for, for decades. He's taught at uh, Harvard Business School. He served as visiting faculty at MIT Media Lab in Stanford. He's also a Tony nominated producer of Film and Stage, uh, wrote the best selling book, Jamming the Art of Discipline, uh, the Art and Discipline of Business Creativity. He also has a uh, an awesome Forbes column. Uh, we'll be sharing his latest article that he just published today uh, with you here in the comments section. Uh, and also make sure to follow John on Twitter and LinkedIn. John, welcome to Intersections. Hey, Brian. So, uh, well, let me reciprocate uh, because um, uh, I, uh, I love improvising an introduction of Brian Solis because there's so many things that I could say. Uh, Brian has been around also in the innovation field for decades, uh, which makes us a, um, uh, a set of accomplices second to none, I would say. Uh, and we have complementary perspectives, professional experience and networks, which I think uh, makes intersections all the more interesting. Brian has been a domain expert in matters digital before digital was actually recognized as a, a thing unto itself. And has made very valuable bridges between the digital domain, uh, innovation, social media, marketing, uh, organizational change, and more. Uh, he publishes and uh, expresses his thought leadership in multiple modalities, keynote speeches, best-selling books, uh, online, uh, uh, this uh, show, and others, and even has a day job, uh, curiously enough, which is uh, Global Evangelist for Innovation at Salesforce. So there we are. Yes, thank you for that, John. Uh, it's it's uh, coming from you. Um, these introductions always mean a lot. And to everyone, again, please share where you're tuning in from, share your comments and questions. We're going to go ahead and jump right into uh, the show and introduce our first guest. Well, let we me, have, if, I, yeah. if I can just- Oh, yes, uh, that's uh, right, John. I, I have a special announcement. Um, Lee Kai-Fu is recognized as one of the world's leading authorities in AI and the future of AI. Uh, he's published a couple of books on that topic already, including one on the competition between the US and China uh, in AI a few years ago that was very influential. Um, uh, to make a long story short, he and a colleague, uh, Stanley Chen, who's an ex-Google guy and uh, turned science fiction writer, have just uh, released a book called AI uh, uh, 2041, which is, I think, really required reading for uh, intersections, uh, the intersections community. 
Uh, and next week, we are privileged to uh, screen a one-hour interview with Stanley and Kai Fu that we did uh, 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 asynchronously because they're in China and you know the time zones were a little complicated. Uh, Brian also alluded to my column on Forbes, and we'll post later in the uh, chat a link to an article that I just posted this morning uh, called AI 2041, so a commentary on the book, but the subtitle is So What for the Humans? Because... Um, all of this has vast implications for uh, the trade space, for uh, humanity, what it means to be human, what the relevant uh, human proficiencies are in a world where we're increasingly entwined with um, uh, digital intelligence, whether we want it or not. And that article has since been shared uh, in the comments section. Uh, and thank you for that, John. So we will be airing that special episode. It's a one hour conversation with them exclusively their new book and their thoughts on the future of AI and uh, what role do humans have? Uh, certainly, it isn't going to be uh, news reporting on social media. I think we've lost that job, <laughs> or <laughs> at least the right to have that job. Now, with that said, John, thank you for doing that. Let's introduce our first guest, uh, Dr. Mandy Bray. Uh, she is the author of the book, The Values Compass, What 101 Countries Teach Us About Purpose, Life, and leadership, uh, and this is certainly this is certainly a book that we all could use. I I actually have the book. It's uh, it's in it's in Tahoe where I am not uh, at the moment, but I can now return home safely. That they have the fires under control. Uh, Dr. Ray, welcome to Intersections. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's our pleasure. It's our pleasure. So before we jump in, uh, I'd love to hear a bit more about your uh, path to the Values Compass. Uh, and then maybe if you want to give us a quick overview of your work and, and the book, and we'll just jump right in. Um, okay. Um, so when I was hearing your bios, actually, I feel like there's a lot of similarities. Um, I also have a column on, in Forbes uh, about values. Um, and before writing this book, actually, I would say the the seeds of this book are at Harvard Business School and MIT. Um, and essentially it was a path where we began to realize, especially during the last financial crisis, like 2009, 2008, that when um, we are far from our values, very quickly things can go wrong. There can be a disharmony. And even I remember there was a course where, or, or a, a lesson where we were, talking about how to stay, what you have to do to stay true to your values and out of prison, essentially. Um, and we started a program called the MBA Oath, which was essentially taking an oath as you do when you um, practice medicine or law. And you, in, in business, you would say, you would stand by certain values and say that you um, hold to account, you're, you're being you're willing to be held to account and that it's not just the shareholders that matters, but all the stakeholders in society that are affected by your product or service. Um, and as this, as I began to do a deep dive into these values that we were talking about, we created a global business oath. So something that not only MBA students take, but actually people from their companies start to take. And we started to work with leadership and so this book came about, uh, and thank you for sharing it. This book came about really as a colorful guide to those values, but it's also a deep dive into your personal values, your core values, as you can see on the screen, and then a concentric, like an onion layer outwards. And it helps you boil down to your top five values, and it helps you prioritize them. Because when everything's at an equal footing, it's really hard to make decisions because you've decided some things are equally important to you. And yet, when you prioritize them, it's much easier. As the Dalai Lama says about the book, it leads to greater success, fulfillment, and happiness, but essentially harmony, harmony in your decision making, whether they're small or big decisions. And rather than giving you a very dry textbook, um, I decided to make this a colorful book by taking you around the world to 101 different countries. And each country has been distilled into a different value. So you imagine what you can learn from Japan about respect or from South Korea about dynamism, like being dynamic, 
or Mongolia about autonomy. And then if I take you to the other side of the planet, if we can talk about the positivity in Peru or um, diversity from Colombia. Now, this is just a way of sharing these values as they're performed in practice, as different countries have pivoted around them so that this is an easy to engage with book and essentially each of these values are summarized in just two three pages and it's deliberately done so that this process could be as quick as 15 minutes or as long as a off-site um recruit for a company well what a lovely what a lovely premise and it's <laughs> honestly it's it's uh Honestly, it's a book that I think we could all we could all read. Uh, and I also wanted to just take a minute to welcome everyone from all around the world, uh, Spain, uh, Dubai, Canada, uh, and places, uh, Nigeria, places from all around the United States. Thank you. We also have some fans of the book already, uh, Dr. Ray, which is fantastic. Uh, let, let's let's uh, let's talk about the importance of values in 2021, uh, especially during a time where we've seen constant, constant division uh, intentionally uh, uh, introduced into societies all around the world uh, and continuing uh, in, in these times. Uh, also add to that the mix of sort of uh, digital's influence in, in one's personal life uh, and sort of recalibrating subconsciously uh, our... Our, our compass, I guess, is just probably the most direct way to put it. Uh, and how we might realize we need this book, even if it doesn't seem like we might. Um, so firstly, when you were welcoming, I, I noted that you were welcoming the Spanish who relish enjoyment and the value of enjoyment, Nigerians who are extremely driven and what we can learn from Nigerians. And I think you might have said Canadians. Canadians, well, yes, absolutely. Yes. Middle East as well. Oh, in the Middle East. So with Canada, the value of being open and welcoming. And I think you said Dubai, so the UAE, United Arab Emirates, and the vision that they have. They already have a 2030 vision and then a 2050 vision. And so in answer to your question of why would this be relevant to you, especially in this time of recalibration, this is exactly why it's relevant, because we have pressed the reset button or the reset button has been pressed. Now, it really doesn't matter how you're being asked to work. You have a moment where you can shape somewhat what you're willing and not willing to do. And when you have a moment of free fall like this, it's important to know, well, what do I want to shape it into? What would serve me? What matters to me most? And this book helps you strip away all the other influences that you've had, maybe influences at work or from your place of faith or from your parents or your family or your upbringing or your social context. And it helps you think about what really makes your heart sing, what's working for you and what's not. And as you get closer to what matters to you most, what you really value, you find that then there's a, honestly, there truly is a transformation. You you transform from being maybe 80% effective to 150%. Like you bring your whole self to what you're doing. Yeah, the the, the, the compass metaphor is is actually more more meaningful now than than ever. Uh, I had found, for example, uh, that my my compass was actually off and that my center of reference of decision-making for professional and personal decisions, uh, while it seemed like it was calibrated and centered, it was actually, uh, I was actually making decisions for several years that were pulling me away from what I believed my core values uh, uh, and, and morals were. Uh, it was interesting though, that I didn't realize it uh, until I started to see the ramifications of those decisions and wondered how could this possibly be happening? Uh, that led me on uh, several years of research uh, in terms of the, the influences of, of what we see online, you know, how that factors into things like your self-esteem, your ambition, your aspirations, uh, how it is that we, like, like many corporations compete quarter to quarter uh, without that long-term vision, we tend to compete minute by minute by what's popular or what's trending or what the latest challenge is online. Uh, and over time, our compass uh, is, is, is affected. 
Uh, and so I think that there's millions of people all around the world that actually think that they're making decisions uh, or that their moral compass or their values compass are actually calibrated, but in fact, they're not. Uh, and curious, how, how, how do you reach uh, someone uh, like that to help them maybe just be curious enough to see uh, what else is around the world, quite literally from your book, uh, to, to inspire them to maybe think differently about how they move forward? Well, let me ask you, how, what, what happened in your life to take you from when you were veering away from what you thought was your centre or your right place to what happened to bring you back? Oh my goodness, that's a that's a that's a conversation uh, for another day, and maybe and maybe over drinks when no one else is listening. But it, I will say though that I did I did write about it in, in, in it was a book called Life Scale, and uh, what I will I'll just sort of say that when you start to see things that are close to you, not so close to you, uh, and you don't realize over time that that distance is sort of manifested until one day you see that it's far away. Uh, it, it is a, it is a bit of a wake up call and that didn't happen on just one front and it just happened on a lot of fronts. And it was interesting that it was like a surprise uh, when it shouldn't have been a surprise. And that's when I had to uh, do some deep soul searching and also some research as to how could I be that off in terms of calibration uh, and, what 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 caused it so that I could then figure out how to solve it? Right. So I would say it's almost when you're when you're being um, nudged. Uh, you know, when someone's trying to give you a lesson, almost like when the universe is trying to tell you something. Initially, it will tell you softly, and then it will become a little bit more impactful. And then at some point, it will feel like a slap in the face, and you'll think, "Where where on earth did this come from?" Um, so. What I have found is that people get to my work either when they're, well, firstly, I work a lot with companies, I work with schools, and I work deliberately with um, business schools and uh, young people, because I wouldn't want, I mean, it does happen to all of us, it happened to me, where you start your career and you're having to recalibrate and recalibrate and recalibrate many times over. But how great would it be for us to allow our young people to um, think about their eulogy right from the go-get or think about who they admire and perhaps why or to think about um, what legacy they wish to leave so that their decisions are not being made minute by minute or second by second as you were saying or not being made just for the next job or for the next step but rather for the person that they wish to be known as or for um Almost, almost being able to be inspirational and aspirational. So not where you are now and not where you are in the next one or two years or six months even, um, but rather to, uh, to get to that, you know, the long-term view. That's so important. It's so important that 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 question and and John, I'll just make this comment and and I'll pass over to you. That uh, that question about who, who, who do you want to be recognized as is is a wonderful exercise uh, and and, uh, and and an excellent rabbit hole to go go down because that that was really clear in understanding uh, where to recalibrate, see that see that delta as, as to where you are versus where where you think you are. Uh, but uh, that was wonderfully said. John, over to you, my friend. So um, we have a lot to talk about. You know, uh, some of the writing I've been doing recently has been about uh, applying the theory of multiple intelligences to leadership in this kind of um, bizarre period of history. And one of the intelligences that I've been writing about is moral intelligence. Um, I would be curious to know how your work informs the process of actually uh, cultivating whether you want to call it moral intelligence or values-based um, proficiency. Um, I, I wonder if you see those as being synonymous, first of all, but then, uh, you know, enumerating the values is one thing, but actually instilling them is another, whether it be in MBAs, whose character is already pretty well formed, uh, or in kids. Uh, so then that relates to the whole positive education movement, which I'm curious to know about your feelings for, or uh, if you have them. Um, anyway, so uh, over to you. 
So I'm not sure if you noticed, but I was trying to be very subtle. Um, my son was in the room just a few moments ago as during the last question. And um, rather than, he could tell that I was engaged. He couldn't tell with what or what, whether it was important. So he left me a note. Um, and the reason I mentioned that is because ever since he, and in fact, my children were born, I have two, um, we've been hosting values classes. And it's been, um, to your point, yes, your character is formed. By the time you get to an MBA, for sure, your character is mm. definitely being shaped or has been shaped. But the first five years of a child's life, and then actually the first 15 years, as we know, it's kind of a seven-year cycle, they, um, there's a lot that can be done. And I don't, I don't feel that people, yes, you're born in a particular way, as in there, are, there is a certain part that's nature and a certain part that's nurture. Now, if I say to a child, um, what, you know, you must be kind, it doesn't really mean much. Right. But if we start describing how, how did you feel when, or describe a time when someone was kind to you, how did that feel? And what would it look like if you were kind tomorrow? Like, can you give me some examples of that? And as they start talking about it and thinking about it, and indeed what it's like to be unkind, um, they get to see that the being that being kind is not just for them or the other person. It's for a better life all round. They, they can see the benefits of it, and I think that's really. And then they can try things out and practice and see what happens when I do this action and what happens when I do the other, the converse or the inverse. And so, um, having this education system right from the get go, and really, you can start talking about this and practicing this from we started these lessons when the children were two and three and so kindergarten upwards we found that you can actually instill many values much it's almost like you have putty in your hands and you're able to mold that putty more easily so with respect for example kindergarten children in japan are taught really from the get-go that when you come from outside take off your outdoor shoes put on your indoor shoes and when you when you are after lunch pick up all your litter and pick, you know, you don't, we don't even need a janitor here. We can clean up after ourselves. And when you start instilling those practices really early on, you don't have to keep on saying it and saying it and saying it when the child's 16 or 21 or 31. Um, yeah. The yeah. challenge though, is that um, you're describing a very uh, specific uh, activity and, you know, we have billions of kids and I, I would argue that, you know, if you, speak to people uh, around the world and kind of deconstruct what their what their values are something something may pop up uh in the in the discourse but operationalizing it and instilling it is very different from reading it and that's particularly a problem with executives and then uh with um mbas as we just said so i'm, I'm still scratching my head as to how your insights actually get internalized so that people's behavior and thought process actually changes as opposed to reading some article in Harvard Business Review, which doesn't get you very far. Absolutely. Well, when you know, as a, let's say you're talking to the C-suite, when they begin to realize that they're not able to attract millennials unless they're able to be clear about their values mm -hmm. and unless they actually um, have a set of values, when it's hitting your bottom line, you do notice a little bit, you will care. Because whatever it is that they value, it has to come from there. So if they care about, you know, achievement or profit, mm. well, then you show how this is relevant. And it is relevant. It is, you know, it's like impact investing. At one point, we had thought we we're doing someone a favor if we're doing impact investing. And another point, now you begin to realize that actually, not only is it good for, yes, it has some benefit for the planet, but it's actually also good investment sense. And it's the same right. with diversity, inclusion, equality. If you begin to show how many better ideas you have if you have a more diverse team, then you'll then you'll probably get through and you do get through. So this is not about let's do some good people. This is about this being true to your values helps you attract attract employees, the the employees that will also resonate with your set of values that you've articulated. So one, mm. it's about having a process to figure out what they are. Two, then being able to articulate them effectively enough such that you hire accordingly, you have the customers that will resonate with them, the supply chain that resonates with them. And actually, you're much more effective as a company if you do that than if you don't. Yeah. 
Okay, so we, we have a limited amount of time. I just want to ask you one more question and then uh, toss it back to Brian. So, um, you know, your book, which I have not read, but just ordered uh, while we were speaking, um, talks about 101 countries. And, you know, that sounds a little like, you know, Howard Johnson's 26 flavors go in and pick the one you like. Uh, from the point of view of the global uh, 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 landscape, um, and, you know, you could argue that Global civil society requires a canon of values that isn't a, um, uh, you know, an indexed 100. This is what 101 countries do, but a convergence around what the core set of values are that uh, are relevant for all of us. So I just wonder what you think about that. OK, uh, three quick points. You spoke to me about moral in a previous question. Mm -hmm. um, just to be clear, I am I this is not a moral guide. This is not to say that one person's values are morally, or that a certain set of values are morally better or right or more just than another set of values. This is not, this is not the study that I've put forward. Right. Um, if I share with you a fact that re between Republicans and Democrats, actually nine of their top 10 values are similar. They might be prioritized differently, but they're actually very similar. And what's the um, evidence for that? Oh, it was just a study we took. We just asked many, many, many different people across America, both Republicans and Democrats, as to what their values were. And there was a lot of crossover. And even in my going around the world, this is to answer your question of, you know, that uh, if I give you many flavors and et cetera. When, when I went around the world, actually, what I found is, although I'm showing you the nuanced differences, we are much more similar than we are different. Mm -hmm. And so if I say to you, or if you say to me that you value freedom, but I have three different types of free. I have freedom, I have independence, I have autonomy. They're yeah. all subtly different. And it's important to have that subtle difference. And it's important to have overlap so that you can really get close to what's really making you tick. Because you might say freedom, but actually it's this fierce independence, or it might even be competitiveness, or it might be that you just don't want to be told what to do. So there's a different sense of that freedom can have a different definition or nuance which is important right. to pinpoint or highlight so it might feel like 101 is a lot but actually having um having overlaps allows you to get even closer to the to kind of the nugget of what you're mm -hmm. you know the core of what you're getting at so uh, was that uh, republican uh, democrat study published anywhere it was published. I'm going to, uh, I can send you the link afterwards. I'd love to see that. Yeah. I mean, cause that's, yeah. um, that's, uh, I mean, I'm sure it was newsworthy when it came out, but it certainly is newsworthy now cause it's, it's uh, counterintuitive. And, and by the way, so, you know, I picked the word moral, uh, to be provocative, but not because I, um, wanted to make the point that there was a moral hierarchy, but that, you know, to have a, a, um, to have moral intelligence is to be in touch with values and to have a values uh, animate your behavior and uh, your intentions. Um, and, uh, it, you know, it is, as I think you would agree, although I, I don't want to presume, uh, headed in the direction of defining the good life or the, the life well lived or the uh, life of arete and virtue and so forth and so on, which unfortunately I believe we're, we're painfully distant from as global civil society right now. I mean, I don't know if you agree with that or not, but I, I think you just went blank. So maybe you, oh, okay, you're back. She didn't like that question, John. I was going to say, I mean, that was her <laughs> comment on, on the question. Um, so uh, can you can you hear me, Dr. Ryan, Dr. Ray? Can you hear me? Yes. Can, we, st can you can still... You can. Yeah. No, no, For no, some can reason, um, I can't hear you. You can't One hear moment. me. Let me try and figure out what's. Well, that. that I'm wondering whether to, uh, just to get the audio back, whether I should um, log off and log back on again because I, I cannot that, hear you. Okay, I think we're uh, at the point in the let show. Me try. That is an omen. Uh, of uh, a need to make a transition here. Okay, I think so, the most successful thing for me to do right now, or the, the the best way to do this would be to leave and come back. Just give me a moment, please. Thank you. All right, so I think, uh, Greg, in the interest of time, because it's already 11.05, we should uh, make a transition to Mariano. And when um, Dr. Ray comes back, we should, um, um, you know, just explain the situation to her.
That that so, sounds wonderful, John. So yeah. why don't why don't you why don't you go ahead and make the introduction, and then, uh, G, if somehow you could you could, uh, or maybe Dr. Ray, if you can hear us, uh, we did make the transition to the next guest. So. Uh, <laughs> it's because we're over time, but we do uh, want to have you back because uh, John has more questions and I wrote down a bunch of questions. And I think this is actually a, 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 a very valuable time to have a deeper conversation around this. So I know your travel schedule is busy, but we would love to have you back, Dr. Ray. So uh, without further ado, then, uh, it's a real pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Mariano Baton, who's co-founder and CEO at Mural, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with by uh, direct experience. I just used Mural last week to host a meeting of 20 people and uh, uh, it's become a part of the fabric of my own workflow. Um, Mural's described as the leading uh, provider of digital workspaces for guided visual collaboration in the enterprise. Um, he's a three-time co-founder, so serial entrepreneur, uh, an EY Entrepreneur of the Year, a 20 for 2021 finalist, and um, his mission is to inspire, enhance, and connect imagination workers. I presume that's his term, so they can collaborate and solve hard problems together. And I will also say parenthetically that when I uh, 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 was uh, doing the last cycle of startups, uh, I think this was probably like seven or eight years ago, I met Mariano, and you know he had just come into town, was trying to figure out whether this thing he was working on called Mural should be planted in the Bay Area. And, you know, uh, it was a very kind of early conversation for both of us around our shared passion for creative collaboration. And now um, Mariano is sitting atop a behemoth that's touched all of our lives. So uh, from little acorns do big oak trees grow. Uh, so welcome, Mariano. <laughs> nice to see you again, John. And thank you for the nice words. Um, yeah, it's been a long journey, 10 years, and we had to wait and be patient and learn from people like you along the journey so that, uh, yeah, we, we would be ready for, yeah, what happened the last year and a half it has been spectacular in some regards with the good and the bad, right? Well, I imagine that the uh, pandemic actually was an accelerant to Mural because we didn't have as much the option to go into face-to-face -face workshops and use real post-it notes and real whiteboards and, um, you know, all of the uh, the accoutrement of uh, uh, facilitation, right? So Mural uh, was available just at the right time. The two uh, trends that, that we serve, uh, the first one is, again, people like you have been coining, framing, making plays, for work, right? So like the design thinking methodologies, even Agile and many others, I mean, future casting, have set up uh, rules of play for work, right? That allow multidisciplinary teams to get together, understand problems, come up with possibilities, decide and move on and so on. So that one's first. And yes, before the pandemic, people could afford to get together, uh, hotel space or maybe like a customer engagement because these methodologies are also used for customer discovery, right? Um, but then, yeah, and, and and some folks who already are early adopters in a way, already feeling the pain of either a remote worker in their team or um, that they wanted to work on this type of work more frequently, that they didn't want to depend on being on an innovation center to innovate, Yeah. right? Yeah. So that, those two combined, have really been, um, yeah, we, we've grown spectacularly, and it's but it's both of them. It's not just a pandemic, right? It's it's, it's a combination of both. Sure. So um, I, I'd be particularly curious since we have a finite amount of time. Maybe someday we'll have a couple of hours to really you know go deep. But you know, where do you see uh, co collaboration in the virtual domain heading? Uh, and how is Mural uh, kind of uh, positioned for that? And I'm thinking particularly of the latest, um, you know, I suppose we could say combination of hype and reality around the multiverse and, uh, you know, the whole idea that uh, we will become more embodied and more engaged and things will become more intuitive, et cetera, et cetera. And it seems like that is an area that, you know, Mural ought to, you know, at least be thinking about 
but there are probably a number of other things with regard to what happens next for mural, but also for the world of uh, uh, collaboration for imagination workers that that you you know whatever you can comment on. So, what do you think about that? So sure. So I mean, through the last year, I think people got savvy on okay, what's the audio video tooling conversation, right? And and people have settled more or less into something that it's good enough for them to do one-to-one -one conversation, podcast, situations like this one where multiple sure. mass tactical work and transactional work in, in things like Slack and, and, and many others. But people are still nostalgic on the water cooler and the office and that shared space that we had or the ping pong tables as if those are totems of uh, providing the, the gods connections to inspiration, right? And so the reality is like, I challenge that in saying, okay, well, great. Now we know that we can teleport ourselves and our ideas, right? Yes, the multiverse, the metaverse will be maybe more immersive in the connection, but I, I think that the way that we get to better connection is not through the technology connection, but the the scripts, the rules of play, the methodologies, right? The facilitation. We believe that the visual space that we provide is one part of our solution, but then the methods, the games, right? The rules of play, the timer, the sequences and so forth so you can play with your team. And then the facilitator, right? Like, again, you, you've done this for a living, so I'm not need to preach you on this, but um, there's, there is a difference when someone's paying attention and taking the role of the facilitator, not just for time boxing and, I don't know, making people participate, but also like to pause and, I mean, have people ask questions, help, help them think laterally, help them move through the game to accomplish the goals of that meeting and also navigate uh, potential conflict, good conflict along the way. So I'm more bullish on ways of working, methodologies, facilitation, more than like super connected VR, AR connections. We are talking with you know, folks from Facebook and we had a meeting this week, something that's there, but I think that technology is good enough already, combination of video plus a shared canvas to just build deep connection with your team and do hard problem solving online. The thing is that we need to learn how to do it well through guided methodologies. So um, that's a great segue to the next thing I wanted to explore with you, because it seems to me that um, Mural is in many respects a platform in the sense that it has a very rich tool set and the tool set is malleable. Uh, and um, uh, then it is an invitation to people who have specific um, domain expertise or methodological expertise to take advantage of all of that. And clearly there is some uh, significant amount of uh, procedural knowledge that is already available through Mural. Um, but I'm wondering where that goes because I, I can almost see a hierarchy of uh, facilitation where, you know, at the, at the top end, the high end, uh, the Maslow's, you know, tip of the pyramid, um, you've got human facilitators who are experienced. And those are people that I think you've done a great job of cultivating uh, by bringing them into the community and supporting them and, uh, and giving them certain dispensations, uh, uh, which I think I'm one beneficiary. But, you know, the base of the pyramid is the, the bigger uh, audience. And that's where, in some respects, um, you know, it's, it's lower margin but higher volume. Uh, to be crass about the, for it from a marketing perspective. And you could imagine that um, some of the facilitation uh, could become automated, that the menus of use would be more, um, uh, um, uh, I won't, won't say commoditized, but they would be more available so you could have someone with not very much facilitation experience or maybe no facilitation experience still doing relatively sophisticated, facilitated um, uh, activity. Uh, and so uh, I'm, I'm wondering the extent to which uh, Mural is going to get more involved in the uh, sort of methodology codification, IP curation, um, 
uh, and and kind of uh, nuanced approach to facilitation uh, as a functionality at different levels. Because it seems to me uh, that we would agree that that's probably the the most valuable frontier. So yeah, we sometimes use analogies with gaming, right? So like game consoles and games on top. And in a way, we want to be that game console that allows you for multiplayer games to be played. Games for work, right? Yeah. And another game analogy is like the playmaker, the playmaster, the like Dungeons and Dragons person that makes sure that other people are having fun, right? Yeah. It's a role to play. So yes, all meetings have a facilitator. Maybe they don't know that they're being the facilitator, but all of them have. And of course, uh, as a team leader, it's really hard to participate as a team leader, decide maybe something a team leader, and also facilitate a great meeting, right? right. But the thing is, like, we always hired facilitators for the big meetings, right? Like strategic planning or innovation and so forth. And I wonder if, like, we shouldn't be able to provide you with access to folks that through like, creation scoring or, or some other mechanism, you could hire John Cow for again your big offside whatever, but also in John Cow's you know twenty years ago to also help you with um, again your your staff meeting every week, right? To make sure that that's the like, best use of time because we spend a lot of time in meetings, and I think that meetings are, are a lot of them are necessary. It's not that I mean there's a lot of trends on async work. There's a lot of things to be done asynchronously. Yes, even a meeting can be unbundled, but there is some beautiful friction that happens in certain meetings when there's like different uh, sort of people participating in 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 like being present there collaborating right so so yeah i mean i i welcome different methodologies like you're showing here uh, i don't want to be the person that says this is the way and we had this debate right john a long while ago if there's like a, a way for innovation versus multiple ways for innovation and I've come to believe that there's certain principles that, that are, are like common, but there's different activities and games that could be varied depending on context, right? So which industry, uh, type of team and so forth. So for now we're taking a more plural approach and curating some, uh, and hopefully we become a platform for creator economy for a particular type of creator, which is like folks like you, right? That have spent time designing games, designing methodologies, for others to use and, and reuse and reuse and reuse and reuse and, and give some credit to the, the people behind the idea. Yeah, understood, understood. So what impact do you think uh, AI and data science is gonna have on this whole world of virtual collaboration? Do you see um, technology playing a bigger role, especially at that more bottom of the pyramid um, level of facilitation? And um, I'm sure you're collecting oceans of data uh, you know, I mean, you probably are the Saudi Arabia of collaboration data right now. Uh, is that a value to you in terms of where you're steering Mural uh, going forward? So, uh, I mean, the, the data that we hold is is very precious and very private, right? So it's, there's data and metadata. Uh, on the metadata side, yes, we're trying to understand uh, things that are repetitive right they're boring those things we should try to automate right like we don't want a human to be pressing the button for the timer forever right that it's just like something that can be understood and done same with certain potential trans transcriptions and things like that but uh, the type of work that we support john is, is that's why the provocation on imagination work or imagination workers uh, it's not that repetitive some parts of it is repetitive, but it's not that repetitive. I think that AI could be interesting on things like, I've seen a lot of workshops called Sideways where the input into one of those sticky notes it has little levels of abstraction, right? So someone might say, okay, what's the problems that we faced last quarter? So, well, lack of transparency, very high level, and someone saying like, such and such did not disclose that information, very precise and tactical. If we get, observations and ideas in different levels of abstraction, it's really hard to cluster them, to vote on them, like carry on with techniques that are relevant. So I think that there is some cues and some feedback that we can give the facilitator to do better job at 
sp spotting those. Um, and the other thing that we've been thinking a lot is like we always have this idea that we don't want murals to be static, right? In the sense that you might have planned a great meeting and all of a sudden you go through a tangent and maybe the tangent is super interesting and you want to make sure that we might be like saying, hey, recommend that maybe you switch the arrangement of the meeting and do it that quickly. So there is some around making sure that uh, we can let the facilitator adapt fast if, if they're going sideways in the, in the agenda. Uh, but it, when it comes to like automating this kind of work, it's it's the type of work that we don't want automation on because it's the fun part, right? Like uh, imagination, play, innovation, team building. That's the type of work that we as humans can like enjoy it and are pretty good at it versus automation, mm -hmm. right? Well, it, it seems like it's an opportunity for uh, what people have been talking about in the AI space as hybrid models, because um, in a way, freeing up the imagination oriented facilitator from having to do uh, boring, repetitive things or to uh, do the analytics around process um, uh, gives them more time and energy to do the thing they do best while technology can do the thing it does best. And now, you know, with um, uh, the ability of AI to parse oceans of semantic data and do pattern recognition and, you know, do things like, uh, I'm just making this up now, uh, cause you know, well, we, <laughs> we're, 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 we're edging into brainstorming mode, but you know, uh, uh, showing the pattern of interaction among the, the people showing the analytics around the tempo of discovery, um, you know, bringing external information in, um, you know, there's there are some uh, kind of uh, more routine aspects of facilitation that, um, uh, frankly, human facilitators don't have time to do right now, uh, where you can bring information just in time in, into an environment or, uh, you know, the, the AI, the algorithm could be saying, oh, you know, um, things are getting a little stale here and, you know, have a, a set of uh, rubrics for actually being able to make those kinds of, of statements. Now, again, I, I agree with you that it's the human side of facilitation that feeds human imagination, that creates, you know, human results. But um, we can't avoid the fact that, um, you know, technology is an increasing part of our lives. And it seems to me facilitation is ripe for uh, a reconceptualization at this point. In yeah, I mean, it feels like a co-pilot, co-facilitator. Yeah. It makes total sense. And we do be careful to not get to clippy mode um, but yeah there, there are certain things that that again definitely deserve and we have a design principle which is free up brain space there's things like for example like all of the logistics right so making sure that people uh, are I mean, getting there and and did someone did everybody did the pre-work right all of that anxiety again yeah. we should be able to to streamline a little bit and we will uh, as we think of not just the live together time as the core of what we do, but like what happens before, during and after, and how we start introducing more async into these workshops, right? I mean, leaving like kind of breadcrumb videos for, for people in different time zones to carry on with a, a workshop. So I'm gonna turn it over to my partner, uh, Brian, but I, I wanna say, Mariano, it First of all, congratulations, you know, my hat's off. I, I, I saw you, you know, at a very early stage of all this and it's amazing to see I you. Have more hair. And, um, you know, happy to brainstorm with you at any time. I would, I mean, I'd, I'd love to uh, follow up on that because, uh, yeah, again, we, a lot of, uh, we have a lot of learning and I think that it's a good time for us to like, maybe collaborate again or something. Excellent, okay. Thank you. So over to you, Brian. Thanks, John. Well, Mariano, congratulations. Uh, I was introduced uh, to to this uh, from John uh, about a year ago, uh, and also several uh, several folks on our team at Salesforce actually use this in some of our more uh, creative uh, in creative engagements. So before we uh, I, I jump into my first question, can you explain to everyone how you describe an imagination worker? Yeah, so I actually have a T-shirt that I uh, like. Uh, so it's like anybody and everybody that uh, can see the world as a better place and can do something about it to change it. Right? It's it's a provocation, right? Another thing that we say is we believe that everybody with a brain 
can use imagination, but they forgot it at school or at work. Um, so the idea here is anybody and everybody went to kindergarten and not just use their imagination, but applied their imagination, right? Through drawings and, and making pictures and, and, and diagramming. So to better understand each other. Of course, if it just stays there, it's imagining that you're working, right? So that's why like we, when we added the imagination worker is uh, you actually do something about it. But sometimes we went over to like just like routine procedures instead of stepping back, thinking about the possibilities, imagining the possibilities. Also, um, this putting together the again, visualization of your ideas so that people could understand you versus just like, talking about it. And there's a lot of power in in visuals for communication and for collaboration, especially early on in projects and and new things. Especially, especially at a time where language is is an is is an increasing barrier, but so is communications. Right before it might have been uh, words and interpretations of those words and how they're strung together, but now it's uh, you have the medium as the message, uh, where. If you're a TikTok user or a YouTube user or an Instagram user, you learn how to talk differently. Uh, and that could be visual, that could be truncated in like Twitter. Uh, and so we, we're, we've created more barriers than we realize. And visual seems to be sort of this great, this great uh, magnet to bringing people together. Uh, the one thing that I had learned uh, going through the research on my last book was that uh, things like you, like you said, uh, and also like Sir Ken Robinson, uh, we used to used to profitize was that we did that we did lose our ability to be imaginative to be curious uh, to be playful uh, and that life has its way of of putting us through structured and rigid uh, processes uh, and then hierarchies that sort of reinforce those processes uh, but uh, as AI starts to become uh, more let's just say uh, pervasive, the need for all of us to be creative uh, and more visual uh, is actually not a luxury anymore. It's a required skill set for the future. Uh, and so using tools like Merle, I could see uh, become um, a catalyst for giving us that skill set. But I've noticed uh, with, with your product and other creative products uh, in the past that it tends to attract the creatives who are who who recognize and embrace that they're creative. Uh, but how do we how do we help others embrace that everyone is creative and it's just a matter of unlocking it and that this is this is a this is a necessary opportunity for everyone to start to learn how to compete in this next generation imagine workforce world. Of course. Um it is an unlearning process, and uh, I think that uh, we need to like. I mean, it's 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 also. Uh, I mean, no, it's not true that people don't like to play. Right? Like we play all the time. I mean, worst case scenario, you play golf if you're like a serious executive, and people play golf and and and, and they have fun with. It. So as long as there's permission to play, and and someone has like, there has to be someone that provokes the play, right? That's why like. People like like you guys get paid money, right? Like because again, you're you're provoking others to 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 try things. Uh, so that's one on the visual side. Same situation, right? Like we are all uh, again as fortunate to still have all senses uh, open. Uh, it's really easier to understand sometimes when you draw something, make a diagram, or, or see a picture of something. So, and I think that all people get it. Right, so it's it's not about like it's not a rational thing to explain. It's just like they are scared the shit out of sorry, of 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 of, of uh, looking that they are rookies, right? Uh, so it is a, a I mean, cult cultural norms and permission to to fail, and we always end up in the same situation, right? So it has to be okay to fail. Uh, I mean, okay, arts and outcomes, not outputs, and so there's there's all this. Thing. And, and again, I mean, I think that as companies that have that culture uh, succeed, others say, holy shit, like we are, I mean, if we don't adapt, if we don't bring that, okay, we, we'll be gone, right? So uh, all of these things, again, playing games and, and using imagination seem tactical if you don't make space and time for imagination and play in your company.
right? And that comes from the top. So thank you for inviting me for this, because again, I, I, I picture you guys are speaking to a higher executive group, and it's just, it's what I do. Like I, I mean, my real job as a CEO is to convince others to give space and time and permission for people to play and visualize at work. Yeah, I, I think that's the thing that we all, um, I, I often say that if you're waiting for someone to tell you what to do, you're on the wrong side of innovation or you're on the wrong side of creativity. But it's that permission uh, that I think has to come from somewhere. Uh, and so if we're waiting for it to come from the top, uh, we're, we, we might be on the wrong side. One thing to consider would be uh, also that we can give ourselves that permission. Uh, and that permission uh, is something that I feel like is, is, is a, a self-taught skill uh, that we all need to embrace. And so with the time we have left, which is basically none, uh, <laughs> can you share with us uh, your advice to the individuals, not, not just the executives who are running the show and are leading from their traditional management styles, but the advice to the individuals watching the show right now Give yeah, them the I, permission. Well, I mean, you don't need permission. That's the honest truth. No one's paying attention to what you're doing all day long, right? So just go and get started with something. Grab a, a, a few people that also are in the same mood and show progress on something. Like show progress and, 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 and show it. Like it's, it's, it's experiment like an owner. Try something new. You don't need much time to do a, like a, a, a quick experiment and, and, and provide improvement to to your company, right? It could be a small process in your company that it's crazy bureaucratic and you go and look for all the, the, the customers, uh, visualize their customer journey, internal customers, right? And then all of a sudden, like, like show someone, hey, look, this is a diagram of the steps that someone needs to take to fill out an expense report. And it's like, holy, and, and, and put, uh, I mean, quotes on, on those things. And even better, bring the someone else along. Those little examples make the big, big, big impact. And by the way, Mural is free now, so you can go get started. Start an account, start for free. We don't charge for, for, for an account that's good enough for you to start a cultural transformation that it's ultimately what we, we help teams do. Yeah, well, culture is, at, at, in, in every research report I've ever led, I always ask, what's the biggest, uh, what's the biggest obstacle to changing or driving or doing X and what's the biggest accelerator or catalyst and culture was always number one, uh, always number one. Uh, so we can't take that for granted. Uh, and as our friend Jason Corman, who's the CEO of Gaping Void, a culture design uh, group out of Miami, uh, he would wholeheartedly agree. Mariano, thank you. Congratulations uh, for everything. Uh, and we, uh, I'm, I'll, uh, I'm going to go create an account uh, following this. <laughs> All right, guys. Thank hey, Mariana, send, uh, send us a picture of that T-shirt, too. We'll share it with the community. Exactly. Cheers. Cheers. Okay, thanks a lot. Take care. That's fantastic. Uh, wow. Excellent. Excellent guest. And, John, thanks for that introduction. Fantastic. So, John, uh, one more time for those who are joining us late. What do people have in store for next week? Ah, so next week we have a special. Uh, we're uh, interviewing uh, Lee Kai Fu and Stanley Chen, who are the authors of AI 2041, which is going to be a blockbuster um, entry into the sweepstakes of books that help us understand what AI is going to do to us and to our society, global civil society. It's 10 short stories sandwiched between a prologue and a technical epilogue. So it's both scientific fiction and uh, nonfiction analysis uh, from two leading lights in this area. Uh, and we were fortunate to snag both of them for an interview. We did it uh, asynchronously because they're in China and time zones are a bit of a challenge, but you know that uh, in no way affects the uh, show itself. So um, uh, tune in. And uh, also uh, uh, I wrote a piece for in my Forbes.com column on the book and on the kind of so what for humans topic, which uh, I certainly recommend to your uh, attention. You can just find it on, you can just um, type uh, Forbes.com slash John K.O. or I think there's a link in the chat somewhere. Yes, indeed. I, I, I 
place the link in the chat and also links to our guests' uh, work uh, and also to Mur Mural. Uh, so fantastic. And again, thank you. You are part of this community. We do this every week for you. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you each Thursday. If you do not, uh, if you have not watched previous episodes, they are not time stamped, uh, meaning that they are not dated. Uh, every episode in every conversation is still as relevant today uh, and will be tomorrow as it was when we first had that conversation. So if you visit intersectionslive.com, you will see a library of all types of guests and conversations related to you and your work and your aspirations. So with that said, uh, thank you. Thank you once again for being part of our community and we will see you next week. Thank you. <music>